And good afternoon, everyone, to the official start of today's great decision program on Persian Gulf security issues um, with our presenter, Robert Asadi, who I'll be introducing in just a moment. I'm going to say a few introductory words. Again, thank you all for joining us today. As you know, this is part of our uh, great decision series that we partner with the Foreign Policy Association uh, in New York. If you have not had a chance to purchase the uh, materials, um, either the book or the DVD, and you're interested, I'm posting a chat in the link here on how you can do so. Um, and they're excellent articles. So even if you uh, missed one of the previous talks, it's still worth reading the articles. Uh, I would note again that our previous talks um, are in uh, on our YouTube channel, uh, where Tim has been loading up the last couple talks we've had, um, and I'm going to post also in the um, in the chat the playlist of the um, uh, of of our great decisions talks from 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 this year, and so keep an eye out for that later. I'll post that as well. I uh, hope many of you were able to join us last night. Uh, for the International Speaker Series talk we had on COVID-19 and the path to recovery. Very powerful discussion um, and featured a local star from OHSU, Dr. Marcel Curlin in conversation with Marin McKenna, the public health uh, journalist and really uh, rich, uh, sobering and informative discussion on, on the, really the topic of our time. Um, we hope that you will be able to join us uh, for next week, we're having a special guest, Ari Shapiro, uh, who, as many of you uh, know, but some may not, is a uh, uh, grew up locally in Beaverton, uh, now the co-host of um, All Things Considered on NPR, just posted in the chat the link to where you can buy individual tickets for his event, as well as the last event in the series later in April with Tom Colicchio uh, of Top Chef fame. Uh, so the Ari Shapiro event, though, is it's next Thursday. We're really excited about it. Um, we also just sent out our e-newsletter a couple minutes ago, and, and it has links in there for that as well. Um, so we hope to see you there. Next week is the last week of um, the Great Decision Series. And again, we appreciate you joining us for, for all this time. And now on to today's talk. I want to uh, introduce our, our speaker, who, who for those of you those of you who've been to our events before, you've heard him talk. Uh, he is an instructor in the Departments of Political Science and International Studies at Portland State University, uh, you know, a, a, a noted expert uh, in the topics that we're, we're discussing today. Um, in fact, he has a brand new book that is coming out. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a real in-depth academic dive into uh, post-revolutionary Iran. Uh, I'm posting a link in the chat here for those of you who are interested in buying it. It's coming out soon, um, both in hardcover and, and in digital. Um, and he might reference that in his talk. Um, and we are excited and honored to have him back today. He holds a PhD from the uh, Department of Political Science at the University of Minnesota and works in the subfields of international relations and comparative politics. Uh, after getting first his BA from University of Iowa before going to the University of Minnesota. I would note that in, in addition to his writing and his studies, uh, and this is always great to see, that he was awarded the Outstanding Teacher Award for the Department of Political Science by the Office of the Dean, the College of Urban and Public Affairs for the 2019, excuse me, 2018 and 2019 academic year. And uh, while it's wonderful to have great scholars on like him, it is also fantastic when that scholar is an amazing teacher. Uh, it really means so much to students and to our members. So, uh, and really there's no higher honor, I think, than getting that kind of accolade as a professor. So without further ado, we're honored to have Robert join us today. The floor is yours. Great, thank you, Derek, uh, for that very, very kind introduction. Uh, also, thank you, Tim, for inviting me <clears throat> to come and speak, uh, uh, speak to World Oregon today. Uh, I'm glad to be back. Uh, this is my second time uh, speaking with World Oregon. Um, so uh, very glad to be here. So um, just to jump in, hopefully you can all uh, see I'm now sharing my screen with you. Um, our topic today, uh, Persian Gulf security issues. My approach to this is going to be somewhat conventional as a political scientist in that I wanna use the framework of levels of analysis, um, global, regional, and domestic. Uh, and by domestic, I wanna speak particularly about Iran's domestic politics, 
uh, as it relates to this question of security in the Persian Gulf region. So that's the plan uh, for what I wanna cover today. I have my timer set so I can uh, stick to 30 minutes uh, and then I'll very much look forward to your questions uh, and comments. So just to provide a little background, I, I understand that uh, you have uh, looked at already um, some of the materials from Foreign Policy Association. Many of you have looked at uh, about this week's topic. So when we talk about the Persian Gulf, we're talking about uh, the eight uh, littoral states here, meaning the eight states that have a shore or a coastline uh, to this body of water, which for some is the Persian Gulf and for others is the Arabian Gulf, uh, depending on where you're situated. And we, I'm happy to talk more about that. Um, in terms of population, uh, around 182 million people, which is up from uh, 24 million in 1950. Uh, these, are, these are from the Potter chapter uh, that some of you, you have looked at, uh, these statistics. And the 2050 projection, which I was interested to see of uh, just north of 235 million. So it's uh, a growing region, um, populations are increasing. Uh, and of course, we all know the strategic significance in terms of the flows, uh, flows of oil. So just a little background, uh, this is a picture that I took uh, from here on the previous slide. You can see on the Iranian side, uh, Bandar Mahshar here near the border with Iraq. Uh, this is a picture I took uh, from there uh, when I visited the, the Gulf uh, from Iran. And it was an interesting, uh, an interesting visit. Uh, it was July of 2013. And if you've been to this part of the world, you know it gets extremely uh, oppressively hot in that time of year. And so I was there with some relatives, uh, essentially at dawn, because uh, that's the only time where you can go and it's uh, comfortable enough to swim. And we were somewhat uh, unsure, like, could we go and access the water, uh, you know, and go in? And uh, I remember there was a, a older gentleman kind of walking along a path near the shore and we asked him, you know, is it okay to swim here? And he quite exuberantly said, this is the Persian Gulf, this is for everyone. Um, and so I thought that was such an interesting kind of note of optimism that this is for all people and, uh, you know, we should feel very comfortable going to swim. Unfortunately, the political reality looks a little different. So I'll share a couple political cartoons. Here, one representing uh, Iran approaching this chair, and it says on the chair, the dreams of hegemony, so the dreams of regional dominance, uh, and Iran proceeding its, with its right foot and left foot. The right foot is the flag of Syria, the left foot is the flag of Hezbollah. So again, this idea that Iran is somehow uh, uh, a rising power aspiring toward regional dominance. If we look across the Gulf, you know, uh, here another political cartoon, Iran and Saudi Arabia staring one another down across the Gulf. And in this case, uh, Saudi Arabia seen as uh, here squeezing or bleeding Syria and Iraq through their support of uh, uh, radical groups uh, in Syria and Iraq. So I thought those uh, political cartoons do a really nice job framing the different threat perceptions uh, of these two kind of uh, very significant states in the Gulf region, Iran and Saudi Arabia. Um, one statistic I wanna share with you, you know, part of the question that we have approaching this security in the Persian Gulf is, who is generating instability? Uh, so in terms of defense spending, Iran spends one seventh of the amount that Saudi Arabia spends on defense, while Iran has roughly two and a half times the population uh, of Saudi Arabia. So I thought that was uh, uh, an interesting st statistic to share. Uh, obviously much of that spending is arms deals concluded between Saudi Arabia and the United States. Um, so uh, I wanted to mention that as well before I jump in, which I'm going to do now, uh, into these three levels of analysis. And so thinking about defense spending, there's a kind of natural connection here to talk about what's the role of the United States in the region. Um, so we know uh, the former administration 
had a, uh, a view of security in the Persian Gulf that was very tied to the United States support for Saudi Arabia and by extension, the GCC, the Gulf Cooperation Council, which I'll explain a little bit more about that in a moment. So uh, famously, or perhaps I should say infamously, uh, President Trump's first trip to a foreign country uh, was not to Canada or to Mexico, uh, as has been the precedent of previous administrations, but was to an absolute monarchy, uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, in May 2017. And so, you know, I'm sure many of you recall some of the images that. Uh, came out in the media uh, after that trip took place. Uh, the trip was not only symbolic, uh, it was also during this time that the US concluded a 110 billion, uh, that's billion with a B, 110 billion uh, dollar arms deal uh, with Saudi Arabia. Uh, one uh, quote I wanted to include here, this is from a foreign affairs article just from last month from Iran's foreign minister, Javad Zarif, uh, commenting on what are the consequences or what were the consequences of this approach of the United States uh, for the region. So uh, Zarif says in this article, Trump further trapped the United States in the region and inflamed divisions to the point where a minor incident might quickly spiral out of control and lead to a major war. And I'm sure you know, if you're following news about this right now, even in the last week, there's been a lot of news about uh, uh, a rocket attack in Erbil in uh, northern Iraq, uh, questions of uh, who was responsible for that, uh, and then uh, US airstrikes against what is being referred to in the media as Iranian-backed uh, groups in eastern Syria, even just from uh, one or two days ago. Uh, this idea that uh, minor incidents now are more likely to spiral out of control, uh, it reminded me of uh, an episode that the author uh, Trita Parsi begins his 2017 book called Losing an Enemy. The book is all about uh, US-Iran uh, nuclear negotiations. He begins that book by talking about an incident from January 2016 in which uh, a US uh, naval vessel uh, in the Persian Gulf experienced some technical difficulties and basically drifted uh, out of uh, Kuwait's territorial waters in the Gulf and into Iranian territorial waters. Uh, the, the boat was then seized by the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps and 10 American sailors were taken into custody. Now, because the US and Iran had uh, open channels of diplomacy at that time in January, 2016, uh, very quickly then Secretary of State Kerry gets on the phone with Foreign Minister Zarif and explains this boat was not trying to uh, uh, invade uh, Iran's territorial waters. It was an accident. Zarif, despite some opposition uh, from Iranian hardliners, uh, accepts that uh, explanation. And within 16 hours, the American sailors were returned uh, to American custody. So, you know, you can ask yourself, uh, five years later in January 2021, how could that incident have played out differently? Um, and so what Zarif is trying to point to here is a consequence of the US policy of maximum pressure on Iran under the Trump administration means that these minor instances, uh, incidents now uh, are, are perhaps much more likely to lead to conflict. Um, let me continue. So to say a little bit about the global level and the US role, we can think about the US military presence in the Persian Gulf in a couple of different ways. On the one hand, we can think what's the cost of the US military presence? Uh, and what is the strategic significance uh, of having such a substantial footprint in the Gulf region? Uh, just thinking about the US and the GCC, of course, the US has uh, the Fifth Fleet stationed in Bahrain, a number of army, air bases, military equipment in other uh, GCC countries. 
If we think about costs purely in financial terms, the war on terror, uh, you know, which transcends beyond the Gulf, of course, uh, to date estimated expense of nearly six and a half trillion dollars, uh, not to mention the human cost uh, from both the peoples of the region and uh, the American military. So the question becomes, are the US strategic interests in the region, traditionally uh, energy, or, you know, meaning oil, anti-terrorism, anti-weapon of mass destruction, are securing those interests best achieved through military means uh, or perhaps through diplomacy? Uh, what about how Iran is perceiving the US military presence in the region? Uh, that Iran is perceiving that as threatening to its own security and leading to essentially an arms race or a, uh, an escalation of conflict. How does this serve broader US grand strategy? Um, there has you know, now uh, uh, for over a decade been discussion about US grand strategy pivoting to Asia. Um, how is the US then perhaps bogged down in the Persian Gulf? When we know uh, here a note about oil, more than 80% of oil flowing out of the Gulf goes to Asia. Uh, uh, you know, as uh, consumption patterns and uh, production is changing in the U.S., the U.S. is now less reliant uh, on this as an energy resource. Not only can we think about cost, we can also think about effectiveness. There was a very interesting piece uh, that just came out in July of last year in the Journal of Peace Research, which I've uh, cited there for you, uh, that looked at the number of armed conflicts in the Middle East region. In 1998, there was five. In 2019, there was 22. So the idea of Pax Americana or the United States military presence providing security in the region, well, now compared to 20 years ago, uh, there's four times uh, the number of armed conflicts in the region. So a question about how effective this strategy has been in the first place. A uh, really interesting quote from the uh, now National Security Advisor, uh, Jake Sullivan, in, in the new administration, uh, and another top uh, Biden advisor, uh, Daniel Ben-Naim. Ben this was from their foreign affairs article last May, uh, where they make the argument that the US security umbrella in the region has given the GCC states, particularly Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates and Israel, what they call, quote, a blank check for destabilizing behavior uh, and keeps the region on the brink of wider conflict. Um, so perhaps this is indicative of a shift we might be seeing uh, in, in the coming administration. Uh, Parsi, again, who I mentioned his book, uh, just from last month in a policy brief, made a similar argument saying, quote, as long as the United States remains committed to intervening in the region militarily, Riyadh and Abu Dhabi pref, uh, tend to prefer an aggressive posture intended to direct US power toward weakening and defeating Iran. Uh, as uh, Iran's foreign minister Zarif uh, likes to put it in interviews, uh, Saudi Arabia and the UA UAE are committed to fighting Iran to the last American soldier. Um, so you know, again, indicating that this outsized US footprint may be creating more instability uh, rather than stability in the region. Let me shift then to the regional level. So I'm, uh, you know, I uh, am making the recommendation or making the argument that a US military reduction uh, then would be the necessary credible signal that the US is no longer seeking to dominate the region. Um, and once that starts to happen, once that comes into motion, it is in a sense the necessary precondition for creating a new, more inclusive security uh, architecture in the region. So US withdrawal is, uh, or US reduction, I should say, you know, there's, there's a debate on this. Uh, does it actually require full US withdrawal from the region, which is what Iran uh, advocates, or does it simply require some military reduction? Uh, but that it's clear that that is a precondition for creating uh, a new regional security institution. Um, and so I want to say a little bit about 
the uh, leading uh, intergovernmental organization in the Gulf right now, which is the Gulf Cooperation Council, uh, and compare that to the alternative that has been proposed by Iran uh, called the Hormuz Peace Initiative, uh, a great acronym, HOPE, uh, uh, which is their uh, kind of opening salvo in thinking about a new regional security architecture. So first, just to clarify, what is the GCC? Well, the GCC, as I said, it's a regional intergovernmental organization. The members are uh, six of the Arab states in the Gulf, uh, excluding Iraq, uh, the other majority Arab state in the Gulf. Of course, Iran is a non-Arab state. Uh, the GCC was formed in the early 1980s. Uh, this was during the time of the Iran-Iraq war. Um, the GCC countries uh, were not uh, keen on having Iraq under the leadership of Saddam Hussein uh, join in this regional intergovernmental organization. Uh, but since the ouster of Saddam Hussein in Iraq, uh, they have not uh, pursued Iraq joining the GCC. So six out of the eight littoral states of the Gulf are GCC members. They're oriented toward essentially integrating their economies, uh, uh, and promoting cooperation among, among the members. It's worth noting that these are all monarchies of various stripes. Some are absolute monarchies, some are constitutional monarchies. The United Emir Arab Emirates is a very interesting political system. It's a federation of seven absolute monarchies. Um, but that looks quite a bit different than both Iraq and Iran, uh, which are republics uh, of, uh, of you know, varying, uh, varying types. So we have the GCC in place. Uh, there you can see the meeting of the heads of state of the GCC in their first summit in Abu Dhabi. There is the GCC logo, which is uh, very interesting in that there are no internal borders among, uh, among member states. The GCC has uh, not been without its own internal uh, divisions, probably you know, the, most famously the uh, uh, crisis uh, uh, that led to a blockade and a severing of diplomatic relations between GCC states and Qatar uh, that started in June 2017 over GCC states concerns uh, about Qatar's support for, uh, uh, I guess we, they would say radical groups in the region like the Muslim Brotherhood uh, as well as Qatar's activities uh, with Al Jazeera and promoting, um, promoting, uh, well, uh, reporting that was critical of uh, other monarchies in, in, the, in the Gulf region. Uh, that crisis uh, and the blockade against Qatar was actually just lifted and resolved uh, last month uh, in January. Uh, but this was a very clear episode, you know, uh, where we saw essentially the virtual collapse of the GCC around this question of uh, Qatar, uh, along with Turkey in the region uh, and along with Iran, uh, support for groups like the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, for example. Um, so that's one thing to consider. Uh, there was a great article that came out last year in the International Spectator uh, that describes the GCC as divided in terms of their perceptions of Iranian threat uh, the article talks about the Iran hawks, uh, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and Bahrain, versus the Iran, the Iran uh, pragmatists or the Iran hedgers, Oman, Kuwait, and Qatar. Uh, it's worth noting that Oman actually played a very important role in the negotiations uh, about Iran's nuclear program uh, in 20, uh, the 2013, 2014, 2015, uh, that eventually shifted to the JCPOA, uh, the Joint Comprehensive, Comprehensive Plan of Action, uh, and the Iran nuclear deal. Um, so uh, the GCC itself is internally divided, but the real notable problem is the exclusion of Iraq and Iran in the Persian Gulf, uh, you know, the main regional IGO in the Persian Gulf. So there has been a proposal from Iran to reform this. 
uh, and that's called the Hormuz Peace Initiative. Iran's President Hassan Rouhani advanced this proposal at the UN General Assembly in 2019. What it suggests is that this should include all, all, all eight of the littoral states of the Gulf, so the GCC plus two, basically, Iran and Iraq. Uh, also possibly adding Yemen, uh, so kind of extending this idea of the Persian Gulf uh, beyond uh, just uh, the states that share, uh, share a coastline. Um, also, the Hormuz Peace Initiative calls for the participation of the five permanent members of the UN Security Council. Uh, I, I can say more about why that is. It basically has to do with a, a precedent for how the Iran-Iraq war was, uh, uh, was resolved in 1988, that there would be some role for external mediation. Um, but in general, this kind of is trying to create a new idea of community in the Gulf region, something called the Hormuz Strait Community, uh, or the HSC, to get around or elide this debate between uh, should it be the Persian Gulf or the Arabian Gulf, say, put that aside, let's just call it the Hormuz Strait Community. Um, so trying to seek some common ground for these seemingly intractable divisions at its most ambitious, the Hormuz Peace Initiative is something like uh, an OSCE for the Gulf. Uh, the OSCE is the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe uh, that was founded in 1975 and has a quite, quite broad mandate uh, of cooperation among its members. They deal with uh, issues of human rights, election monitoring, uh, free press, arms control, at its most ambitious, hope is something like that, an OSCE for the Gulf, uh, perhaps more realistically, something more akin to the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, uh, which has what some have described uh, as more of a soft security focus, focuses more on things like disaster relief coordination, humanitarian assistance. The notion being that cooperating in these fields could lead to some functional spillover uh, uh, that could then uh, produce more cooperation on the more intractable issues. What are some of the shared regional interests? Things like ensuring peace, stability, and prosperity, freedom of navigation, energy security, areas of mutual benefit for uh, all states in the region. More specifically, uh, in the proposal by Iran, there is some uh, you know, focus on several items like uh, arms control negotiations, declaring the Persian Gulf uh, weapon of mass destruction free zone, a non-aggression pact, uh, and so on. I've listed there some of the others, combating uh, drug trafficking, human trafficking, uh, and so on. So uh, here, uh, you know, kind of commenting on the future of this, uh, it's proposed in 2019, some scholars uh, in a piece from the Atlantic Council argued the fate of hope is contingent on Iran's ability to transform the proposal into concrete steps to generate confidence with its Arab neighbors, in addition to garnering the support of the international community, including the United States. Um, in the interest of time, let me just move forward. Uh, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll revisit this in a second, but the idea that uh, a US military drawdown in the region would give oxygen to this type of creative thinking about ways to expand the regional security infrastructure beyond just the GCC, which the elephant in the room, you know, 180 million people in the Persian Gulf region, about 80 to 85 million are in Iran. Uh, Iran is by far the most populous state uh, in the region. So it would be like trying to have uh, a regional security uh, organization in Europe and excluding Germany. Uh, it's just not practical. So uh, this, is, this is one of the, one of the ideas. Let me uh, conclude in the last few minutes here by just saying a little bit about domestic politics in Iran. Uh, the, later this year, this summer, there will be a presidential election in Iran. The current president, Rouhani, is now serving uh, his second term. He's constitutionally uh, ineligible to run for a third consecutive term. So Iran will have a new president uh, and its posture in the region is gonna be dependent on who wins this election uh, uh, in large part. 
So I can say a little bit here, there's a recent data on Iranian public opinion that actually just came out uh, from a Canada-based uh, polling firm. So you're getting it hot off the presses uh, and I wanna share that. Uh, just wanted to show this image here. Remember, I told you about Trump's, uh, pre former President Trump's visit to Saudi Arabia on May 20th. The day before that, Iranians turned out in a presidential election. Uh, and here's an image of that. Again, one day later, uh, President Trump shoring up US relations with uh, one of the absolute monarchies uh, in the region, a resolute autocracy, uh, and that is Saudi Arabia. And the dissonance of those two events was not lost on uh, observers of the region. Uh, just to say a little bit about Iran's domestic politics, uh, despite uh, the uh, despite the argument of some, Iran does have uh, does have an internal uh, well, they have internal domestic uh, political debates. It's true that there is a supreme leader, uh, but there is a dual executive uh, that is an elected president. And in the last 42 years of the Islamic Republic, there's been a variety of candidates. Uh, if we think of a linear political spectrum, we could say those inclined toward reform and pragmatism and those kind of more hardline conservative constitutional originalists, we might say, uh, on the other. So that's what I mean to show in this uh, very simple spectrum. What did that look like in the last presidential election in 2017? We had six candidates who were uh, past the vetting process of Iran's Guardian Council. Uh, and there was a real choice here between the incumbent, more moderate, uh, Hassan Rouhani, and the kind of more hardline conservative candidate, uh, Ebrahim Raisi. Rouhani ended up carrying the day. He won re-election uh, with 57% of the vote. Um, what I wanted to share with you here is let's look ahead and kind of try to prognosticate a little bit toward this June when there'll be another presidential election in Iran. Uh, based on this data from January and earlier this month by Iran poll, they asked for favorability of some possible uh, candidates or political kind of political figures. And it's interesting that the candidate who got the highest favorability was the most conservative principalist candidate in the last election, uh, Ibrahim Raisi, who is currently the head of the judiciary in Iran. Uh, uh, that you know, he appears to be the front runner should he choose to pursue that office. What that means is if Raisi is elected, it's very likely that you will uh, see a a more kind of a confrontational posture from Iran's government uh, in, in the region. So that means this uh, Hormoz peace, peace Initiative is probably out of the picture. Uh, on the other hand, someone like Zarif, the current foreign minister, would definitely double down and continue to pursue uh, this agenda. And you can see, you know, he, he uh, comes third here in the list. So, uh, just something to share there. Focusing on, you know, on Raisi and Zarif specifically, you can see how their favorabilities have changed since the last presidential election in May 2017. Raisi has been on the up from 48% to 75%. Zarif, on the other hand, has you know, maintained relative stability, but down from 70 to 61. So public opinion maybe is shifting away uh, from this uh, more conciliatory diplomatic posture favored by the current president in, in Iran uh, and by Zarif. Um, let me just go ahead. I'm happy to revisit this, but I realize my time is winding down. Uh, so let me just skip to the last point here. Very interesting is what does the Iranian public care about in terms of issues? So they asked in this poll, uh, what do you think is the single most important issue and challenge that our country faces that the next president should address? Again, uh, this is from Iran. The top three or top four issues really, I mean, even top five we could say, but the, the, the big concerns are economic concerns. Uh, we don't get to improving foreign relations until the very, you know, around 3% or so. So all of this, uh, is important to consider in terms of Persian Gulf security, 
because it suggests that uh, if regional integration is couched in, in uh, terms of the language of promoting economic development, it's likely to have mass appeal uh, among Iranians. And so if uh, this program toward regional integration can focus on uh, access to GCC markets, for example, or increasing uh, flights uh, between countries, uh, Dubai to Tehran should be like Portland to Seattle. There should be dozens of flights uh, per, per day. Right now, that's not the case. So as, more, as much as this pitch toward regional integration can be made in economic terms, I think it's likely to be more successful. Um, so thanks for your attention. I'll look forward to questions that you might have. And uh, there's the cover for uh, my book, which is coming out, which is focused on the last 40 years of history in Iran. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks so much for your time. Great. Uh, thanks, Robert. This is uh, Tinder Roche, Director of Programs. Uh, fantastic, um, clear presentation, Robert. It's always a pleasure to hear you lay things out in such a wonderful way. So your poll showed Zarif favoring well, but does Zarif, who is widely respected in the international community, have any actual stated designs on the presidency with Rouhani terming out, or is he just not hardline enough? Yeah, good question. So uh, he has not, you know, he's, it's this funny thing with politicians, right? Like, I, I will neither confirm nor deny, you know, uh, it's hard to get them to say I, I, I completely disavow ever running. Uh, and I don't think Zarif has come out that strongly. Um, uh, the question then I suppose would be, could he pass vetting by the Guardian Council? Uh, you know, in, in my book, I talk about Historically, this is one of the roles that the Guardian Council plays, um, and they have taken on a much larger uh, kind of role in that way, where 99% plus of candidates who attempt to register for president are disqualified. Uh, so it's not, there's not a clear uh, system like, you know, we have in the United States, you just have to be 35 years old, born in, born in the country, and uh, a residence of what is it 14 years of residency in iran you have to pass uh, the uh, the vetting of this body which can disqualify you for any reason really that they see fit so uh, i suppose that would be the big question uh, is if he if he could pass and and really i don't think anyone has a clear answer to that uh, we'll find out in late may mid may uh, whether he you know attempts to register and whether that's passed but it's interesting looking at the field of possible reformist or moderate candidates. Uh, it's a narrow field. Uh, it, you know, there's, there's not a clear alternative to Raisi, kind of the arch principalist who I mentioned. Um, so, it, you know, if I had to place a bet, uh, I, I, would, I would bet that uh, Raisi is, you know, the, the, likely, the likely front runner. So did the comparison of military expenditures that you showed, did that include funds that Iran or Saudi Arabia might spend or might send to support Hezbollah, ISIS, the Houthis, et cetera? Yeah, so uh, if I remember correctly, it's the full, the full uh, defense, you know, uh, the full defense expenditure. Mm -hmm. So in, in Iran's case, you know, the question is the IRGC, the Revolutionary Guard Corps, has a completely different funding mechanism than the Artesh, the Iranian army. Um, I'm fairly certain, 95% certain that that figure includes both IRGC and Iranian army. Um, and in terms of the Saudi figure, I, I have no reason to suspect that it wouldn't include uh, support that they, they give to other proxies in the region. So what is the role of Turkey in the Qatar and Saudi Arabia crisis? Yeah, it's really interesting. So, you know, really, we have to go back to 10 years ago uh, and talk about the Arab uprisings. Um, you know, if you were sitting in one of the monarchies in the Gulf, uh, the Arab uprisings were tremendously destabilizing. This was like the existential threat to the Gulf monarchies. Um, and so the UAE, Saudi Arabia, uh, 
quickly through their support behind the military in Egypt. Uh, uh, Qatar, on the other hand, along with Turkey, supported the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. So in uh, you know, the summer of 2012, Egypt's, Egypt holds the presidential election after uh, Mubarak is ousted in, uh, in 2011. Mohamed Morsi, the Freedom and Justice Party candidate, which was the political party of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, wins uh, with just over 50% of the vote. It's the first democratic election in Egypt's history, full stop, like back to the pharaohs. Uh, and Morsi wins. And this is viewed in, in Turkey, you know, uh, which has been uh, governed by the AKP, the Justice and Development Party under Erdogan. M Muslim Democrats, you know, uh, want to see more of a, a role of Islam in public life. Uh, I think, I think, you know, generally, <laughs> depending on how one thinks about the AKP, they would agree with that assertion compared to Turkish secularists. And so Turkey looks at this election of a Muslim Brotherhood candidate in Egypt and says, you know, that's great. Uh, however, it is deeply threatening, as I said, to the Gulf monarchies. So that's kind of the origin of this split in that Qatar throws its lot in with Turkey and the Muslim Brotherhood. Of course, we know Morsi is only in office for a year. In July 2013, he's ousted in a military coup. Egypt has since been under the essentially military dictatorship of Abdel Fattah al-Sisi to the delight of uh, bin Zayed and uh, bin Salman in the UAE and Saudi Arabia. Um, and so I think that's really the precursor of this, of this split. Uh, and then uh, Qatar you know, continues to support the Muslim Brotherhood, which uh, Egypt under uh, al-Sisi officially declares a terrorist organization. Um, and so that's kind of the, the logic then of how the other Gulf states put the blockade uh, on, on uh, Qatar and you know, limit uh, their air, air travel and all, all kinds of, uh, a, a, of a break in kind of the diplomatic relations. So yeah, Turkey is more on the side of uh, Qatar and I think more on the side of Iran in this in this split um, and has been a, a thorn in the side of you know the uh, uh, the Iran hawks in the GCC we might say Saudi Arabia the UAE and Bahrain. So you mentioned Turkey but uh, Mona you could also speak to the roles of uh, Russia and China in regional developments. Yeah, thank you. Uh, that's those are the other uh, big, uh, big questions. So, you know, I like to think about the relationship between Russia and Iran, like let's use the transitive property of uh, mathematics, you know, if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C, right? So Russia has a very important alliance with Syria. The, the, the whole dilemma of uh, Russia, Russian foreign policy for the last couple hundred years is that it's the largest country in the world, but it has no warm water ports, uh, hence why it cared so, so much about Crimea uh, and also has, uh, has a military alliance with Syria. So Russia and Syria have you know, this uh, alliance of strategic convenience. Syria is Iran's oldest uh, ally in the Arab world. Um, and so by extension, then Iran and Russia have uh, kind of shared interest over keeping the Assad regime in power uh, in Syria. So I think the role of Russia is to, you know, sustain Assad uh, and uh, support Iran uh, in, 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 uh, in that endeavor because Iran is obviously, you know, supporting the Assad regime in, in uh, Syria. So, I think that's probably the most significant role for Russia is as, as it pertains to the Syria issue. Uh, I actually think, you know, if we if we wanted to talk about Persian Gulf security in maybe even ten years, uh, China is going to be the most important uh, the most important actor from outside the region. China has uh, basically, unlike the United States, which has led with military, uh, China has led with uh, economic development. So. China's Belt and Road Initiative is, uh, uh, you know, the kind of flagship program that it has uh, in terms of development aid, infrastructure, 
uh, rather than military aid, which has been kind of the main incentive that the US and Russia for that matter have been offering uh, in terms of their patronage of certain states. Um, there's some really interesting developments as well happening with uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, if you look into this uh, kind of city of the future that Saudi Arabia is trying to develop uh, on the Red Sea, so you know the other side from the Persian Gulf, uh, the city uh, called Neom, N-E-O-M, um, that they are investing a lot in. And if you listen to uh, Mohammed bin Salman, he talks about this, like this will be his enduring legacy of uh, development of this new global city uh, called Neom, uh, as well as they're trying to develop a lot of infrastructure to kind of connect and integrate further with the Belt and Road Initiative, um, but kind of a, of their own, connecting the, the Levant with the Persian Gulf. And so this, I think, is an important way to understand the normalization between the UAE and Bahrain uh, and Israel, the so-called Abraham Accords. Um, and I, you know, which, which uh, you know, so, some might argue was uh, more of a security agreement than it first appeared. Uh, obviously, what does that normalization of relations do, uh, it allows the UAE and Bahrain to buy arms uh, from Israel, uh, which of course, you know, has been happening in a clandestine way uh, for some time. But, um, you know, there's kind of a question here, maybe they're hedging to say, if the US does step back, we can then turn to Israel uh, uh, for military support. Um, and, you know, this uh, plan of developing infrastructure between Saudi Arabia uh, uh, Israel, the Levant, and the Gulf uh, may kind of foreshadow uh, uh, some, some type of normalization between Saudi Arabia and Israel, whether that's a full, uh, full normalization like we saw in the Abraham Accords or not, I think is an open question, uh, but more economic cooperation uh, at least looks like it's on the horizon. So we've got a question actually about that. Um, and they, they, the, the person says it, it is difficult, of course, to talk about Middle East security without mentioning Israel. And how do the Abraham Accords um, um, strengthen or weaken the possibility of Iran's hope initiative? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, as I said, I, I think that in general, uh, it's been underestimated the extent to which this is a, uh, those Abraham, the Abraham Accords were a kind of security hedging uh, where, you know, UN, UAE and Bahrain were looking long term and, you know, uh, kind of seeing if the US did take a step back, um, how can we make sure that we, you know, we, our, our security is uh, protected. Uh, and so access to arms is a, is a big question. Um, so I think in that sense, it, it throws a wrench or it's a, you know, it's a, a disincentive, like why reach out to Iran if you can have a, you know, a closer alliance with, uh, with Israel or with other states in the region. You know, that's, that's one point. On the other hand, you know, there is kind of this idea too, that uh, many of the Gulf states, as I said, have had clandestine relations with Israel for, for some time. Um, and so, you know, some have looked at those and say, you know, they were maybe trying to deliver a foreign policy win for the Trump administration in the hope of uh, re-election. So, you know, maybe we shouldn't uh, uh, get too kind of congratulatory about their significance. Um, that would be, you know, uh, kind of the, the counterpoint to say, well, it, it might not have, uh, ha have such a big, uh, such a big influence. Um, I can say, you know, in Iran, though in the last 40 years, the country has moved a lot toward a kind of more interest-based approach to foreign policy rather than ideological, uh, Iran is, you know, Iran is not talking about exporting the Islamic revolution. Um, uh, but, you know, one of the realities is uh, that uh, kind of resistance against Israel is, uh, 
kind of the sin qua non in Iranian politics. It's shared by both reformists and principalists. So, you know, Iran has uh, uh, condemned the Abraham Accords uh, and said this is a, you know, betrayal of, uh, of the Palestinians uh, and of the, the push for Palestinian self-determination. So to the extent that Iran can use the accords as a cudgel against uh, those, uh, those states, you know, which normalize their relations with Israel to curry favor in the Arab world, uh, they definitely are, are keen to do that. So you've mentioned the term principalist a couple of times. We have a question about that. What, what is meant by a principalist? And as a follow-up to that, who and who is on the Guardian Council you mentioned and how are they chosen? Yeah, great question. So by principalist, I mean uh, uh, one who adheres to a strict interpretation of the constitution of the Islamic Republic so that they, they adhere to the original principles of the Islamic Republic and, and kind of the core animating idea of the Islamic Revolution. Like what makes the Islamic Republic of Iran unique as a political system? It's a certain doctrine that was Ayatollah Khomeini's political doctrine. It's called Velayat al-Faqi or rule of the Islamic jurist. The idea is like who should govern and Velayat al-Faqi says the person who should govern is the one who has the most knowledge of Islamic law. Um, and so principalists are those who are like strict adherents or originalists to that idea. Basically they say uh, the buck should stop at the desk of the Supreme Leader rather than with the elected branches of government, which Iran has a parliament, Iran has an elected president uh, and so on. So uh, that's what we mean by principalist, those who basically wanna vest authority more in the religious institutions of government rather than the Republican ones. Um, to the second question about the Guardian Council, the Guardian Council is a 12 member body Six of those members are directly appointed by the Supreme Leader, uh, and six of them are directly appointed by the head of the judiciary, who happens to be directly appointed by the Supreme Leader. So uh, the Guardian Council, yeah, it's a 12-member body. Members serve six-year terms, uh, but they are appointed solely at the discretion of either the Supreme Leader. Uh, the six that he appoints are religious scholars, uh, and the six appointed by the head of the judiciary are experts in uh, secular law, uh, we, we could say. Um, and yeah, their impor most important function is vetting candidates for office. They also exercise legislative oversight. So any law passed by the Majlis, by Iran's parliament, uh, must be approved by the Guardian Council in that it adheres to the principles of the Islamic uh, revolution and the Islamic constitution, uh, which they are the, uh, they are the, uh, you know, interpreters of, uh, ultimately. So I read today in the uh, newspaper, not an actual newspaper, of course, um, uh, about Iran threatening to pull out of the International Atomic Energy Agency. Is that going to derail plans for the U.S. to rejoin the JCPOA and where where do you see that, that whole process going? Yeah, this is like the, you know, the big question for folks who study Iran's foreign policy. Um, you know, Iran, uh, so just to flash back, uh, the JCPOA is implemented in January of 2016. The US withdraws on May 8th, 2018 uh, by executive action. Uh, for a full 14 months after the U.S. withdrawal, uh, Iran maintained its full compliance with the parameters of the deal. And that's not my, that's not me telling you that. Uh, that's based on the opinion of the IAEA, which is the monitor uh, for the United Nations. And the JCPOA through UN Security Council resolution empowers the IAEA to monitor and verify Iran's compliance. It's only in late 2019 that Iran starts violating some, uh, some of the parameters of the deal. For example, they increase uranium enrichment, enrichment from 3.67% uh, uh, to, I think, between 5 and 10%. I don't remember the exact figure. Uh, 
so it's it's very diplomatic you know they they violate but it's kind of like putting your toe on the line you know if you're shooting a free throw or something you don't just run up and dunk the basketball but you just step over the line a little bit um and so it's a type of violation which kind of indicated uh that they would be open to coming back into compliance but they didn't want to do that for nothing basically they wanted to say the from iran's point of view it's the US that now has a credibility problem because former president trump withdrew from the deal and the manner of withdrawal was interesting because he withdrew the US unilaterally um the jcpoa you know when the when the parties to the jcpoa were drafting this they envisioned that there would likely be disputes along the way and so they created something called the joint commission which includes all the members the five permanent mem members of the security council plus germany plus the eu plus iran and they said if any party to the jcpoa has any doubt about one another's compliance whether it's iran's compliance on uh, its uh, limitations on its nuclear program or uh, the uh, sanctions relief uh, if iran says that they're not delivering on sanctions relief then that aggrieved party can bring it to the joint commission of the JCPOA present their evidence make their case and by majority vote the members will decide whether or not the uh the allegation has validity and so the US never pursued that option they just simply you know withdrew and so Iran uh is you know saying that 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 was not correct and so why would we let you in if you would just withdraw again and not follow the rules um having said that you know i think it would be very difficult now to uh see the jcpoa somehow revived uh, i have in one of my slides you know uh, public opinion in iran has soured on the jcpoa significantly so it's not clear to me where is the political uh capital in iran for a leader to you know try and do that also now uh there's kind of more push toward including the whole range of regional issues support for proxy groups like you you mentioned terrorism uh human rights you know uh the whole principle of the JCPOA was forget about all those other issues we're just going to talk about the nuclear program it seems to me that the next diplomatic step uh is going to uh, going to have to be uh kind of more total in its assessment of these issues so the other big headline above the fold today was about the us coming out and saying that bin salman is responsible for khashoggi's murder but biden will not penalize the crown prince and i'm wondering if you have a comment on that yeah it's you know it's so funny that story it uh, reminds me like a you know headline that says breaking news you know sun rises in the east of course everyone who's been paying attention to the region knows that uh the saudi state was uh was responsible for the murder of uh jamal khashoggi um it's interesting what's happening right now with the us uh related to both of these tracks iran and saudi arabia us airstrikes in eastern syria against you know what's being called iran backed uh groups and at the very same moment this uh, kind of rhetorical uh castigation of uh MBS in Saudi Arabia so you know it's uh if i if i uh, allow kind of the more conspiratorial thinking which is uh, sometimes you know very prevalent in in the region and not for not for nothing uh maybe there's a kind of uh uh effort to drive uh, these two together in their maybe antipathy toward the US or uh maybe that's a bit of a a bit of a stretch but it it seems to be uh, it seems you know to be a a moderation at least from what was the full-throated unilateral support of Saudi Arabia and the GCC at the expense of Iran uh in the previous administration so maybe by the Biden administration is trying to walk a middle path uh and adhere to um principles in foreign policy what a novel idea so you've mentioned a couple times the the sort of seismic trigger that the arab spring the the uprisings caused throughout the region um which was in many ways about um youth movements 
I'm wondering how the largely, you know, the large demographic of under 30s relate to the aging leaders of the Islamic Republic. And is there any burgeoning youth movement that we should be um, understanding or, or, or hearing about? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, Iran right now, 42 years after a, a revolution, um, I like to compare it to other post-revolutionary states, you know, so imagine the Soviet Union in the late 1950s. That was shortly after Khrushchev's secret speech in which he denounced all of the excesses of Stalinism, uh, or even imagine the United States in the 1820s, 1830s. Uh, we couldn't have conceived of uh, how our political institutions have changed since then. So the thing uh, you know, I like to emphasize is we don't yet know what's the full potentiality of the Islamic Republic system. The current Supreme Leader, as you note, is uh, 81 years old. He'll be 82 in April. Um, by most accounts, he's in relatively poor health. He's a cancer survivor himself. He suffered injuries in the Iran-Iraq war. And so it's likely in the next five to 10 years that there will be a new Supreme Leader in Iran. And so the question is, uh, what do we really know about uh, what that office can look like in practice? There's only ever been two Supreme Leaders, Khomeini and the current leader, Khamenei. So it's completely feasible that uh, a new Supreme Leader, uh, you know, could take more of a minimal role in terms of his exercise of power in the political system uh, uh, which I think is, you know, really what is being demanded uh, by a large group, maybe it's a plurality, maybe it's a majority uh, of Iranians, particularly those under 40, who have never lived under any political system other than the Islamic Republic, um, that they want to see, uh, I think, more accountability of government, they want to see uh, uh, less corruption, better economic management, more opportunity. Uh, and I think that, you know, Iran's political leaders uh, ignore that popular sentiment uh, at their own peril. Um, so again, we don't, we don't know for sure, but it seems like the regime is at a really pivotal moment in its unfolding now, 40 years, 42 years after the revolution where there is uh, some potential, I think, for meaningful reform. That's great. Um, Robert, thank you so much. I want to thank everyone who's attending for your questions. We're at our time. I'm going to bring Derek back to uh, take us out into the day. And again, Robert, always a pleasure. And thank you so very much. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Robert, for uh, a great discussion and the fantastic question. Sorry we couldn't get to every single one of them, but uh, uh, we'll be diving more on these topics uh, in the future. Uh, next week, we'll be talking in our final um, Great Decisions program of the year, the Korean Peninsula with former U.S. Ambassador to uh, South Korea, Kathleen Stevens, who is the current uh, CEO of the Korea Economic Institute. And again, as we mentioned, next Thursday, we're honored to have Ari Shapiro speaking for us as in the International Speaker Series. Uh, Professor Sadi, thank you again so much for joining us today. Uh, again, check out the links in the chat where you can get his book or you can uh, get tickets to other events. Stay safe, stay healthy, and we will see you next week.